Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, this is our session, Identifying and Diagnosing History, Possibilities and Pitfalls, and Simon Jarrett is our speaker. So this session is slightly different from the rest of our sessions at the festival, in that it takes a bit more of a medical humanities view of autism or approach to autism, and kind of looks at autism situated in history and other learning disabilities. Um, please note that because we are looking in history, this talk may touch on some more triggering topics for some people. Um, I think we can all agree that in the past we've not been great to people. Um, we haven't always been the kindest to people we haven't understood as people. Um, and so, yeah, if you need to take some time out, this talk is being recorded and you can always catch up later. So do look after yourselves. And on that kind of note, um, I mean, back to today, um, but you might have quite divisive opinions about this talk or a strong opinion one way or another. Um, please do be kind. We obviously really encourage discussion. Um, we've got our hashtag, um, hashtag Autistica Festival, um, and obviously Q and A's will be open as well to ask Simon questions, um, but do try and keep it as discussion and not as agreement, disagreement or tax or anything like that. So I'm really excited to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, I first heard Simon speak at, at a Disability History and Heritage Conference at the Royal Hist Hospital for Neurodisability. Um, and he gave a really interesting talk that has stuck with me since. And I'm really lucky to have heard him speak other times about his research and at his book launch as well. So Simon is author of Those They Call Idiots, the idea of the disabled mind from 1700 to the present day. And he'll be talking about autism and learning disabilities in history today. Simon is a research fellow at Birkbeck and the editor of Community Living magazine. So over to you, Simon. Thank you, Bethan, and um, good evening, everybody. And thank you all very much for um, coming this evening, which I, um, uh, I, I really appreciate. Um, and I hope you're going to find this um, of interest. Um, just a couple of things for me to say as I start out on the talk. Um, the first is I've got a, a, a bit of a cough. Um, so I've got lots of water uh, with me. I did get myself uh, tested, which came out negative. So this is just a, a good old fashioned, ordinary, decent, law abiding cough of the sort we all used to have. Um, but that will explain things if I if I start spluttering a bit at some point. And as Bethan warned as well, this is a historical talk um, and uh, therefore it does involve some historical language. Um, and uh, obviously we know that some of that language is um, unkind and offensive and has certainly developed offensive meanings over, over time. So I will be talking about idiocy and idiots and imbeciles, um, but I'm doing that purely because it is the correct historical context. And um, obviously no offense is, is meant or um, intended. So I hope that's okay. I'll also be using the terms autistic and Asperger syndrome. I know there's a lot of debate uh, about what the correct language should be. I'm simply going to use those terms as signifiers really so that you know um, what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm not using them because I'm implying that they're necessarily um, the correct terms for people to use. Um, I'm intending to talk for about 40 minutes or so so um, and uh, leave a bit of time for questions which I hope you'll be putting into the feed for me to be given at the end. I haven't given a talk before so if you hear me accelerating at some point you know I'm a bit um, um, behind. Um, uh, but hopefully I'll manage it within the 40 minutes. Um, the argument I'll be making tonight um, is, is really about how identifying learning disability in history is something we can do if we construct our uh, argument uh, carefully using different um, sources. Identifying autism in history is a, a, a different matter. And I know there are many books which I'll be talking about, which, which talk about the possibility of various uh, people in history uh, having been autistic. Um, and 
I, I think my, my argument will be is that that can be quite problematic. Um, I'm not saying that uh, there was no such thing as autism in the past, but what I'm saying is there was no such thing as the concept of autism in the past, and that makes things um, very different. So I think one can identify people who had minds and personality types, which uh, quite probably if they were here today could be diagnosed as autistic um, or on the autistic spectrum or whatever, but that that um, uh, is difficult to think about at a time when the concept of autism uh, didn't exist. So I'm, I think what's more interesting about the past is what it can tell us about how people at different times saw people who had minds that they considered quite different and quite atypical. And so that's perhaps something that we can learn from the past um, rather than sort of imposing our sort of diagnoses and pathologies on the past. But um, I, I will make that argument as we go. Other people strongly disagree with that argument. Some of you may strongly disagree with it. Um, absolutely, that's why we're all here, isn't it? We're here to, to debate these matters and uh, discuss them, and it'd be very boring if we all agreed. Okay, and a final thing for me to say is uh, apologies to anyone who's read my book, uh, those they called idiots. Some of the ground I cover at the beginning is covered in the book, but it's quite important to the, to the theme tonight. And I'm also going to be showing some visuals, uh, some images, and looking at them in quite a lot of detail. So um, I'm sorry if you won't be able to pick out the detail depending on the type of screen you're looking on, um, but I know this is being recorded and also I'll, I'll, I'll reference the images that I use so that you can um, perhaps take a look at them independently. Okay, so I am going to start off um, by showing you uh, an image by the caricaturist James Gilray, um, which was produced in 1808, and it's, it, it's called Very Slippy Weather. Now, this is in the 1800s, but it's very much a, a sort of 18th century joke, 18th century um, caricature. And what is happening in this is that the, uh, we're, we're actually at a print shop where Gilray's prints, his own prints, are being displayed. And people used to gather around the windows of uh, print shops to look at the latest prints in the, in the way people used to gather around television shops more, more recently. Um, so you've got a small crowd outside and um, next to them is this elderly gentleman who has slipped over. Uh, on the ice and uh, fallen on his backside. And I've done a lot of research into 18th century humour. There is nothing that 18th century people found funnier than somebody falling on their backside. So this is already a, a, a hilarious joke and his wigs coming off and his purse has come out of his pocket and his money's all over the pavement. The joke is that what he's holding in his hand is a thermometer, which is a very newfangled instrument at this time. And he's been looking at the thermometer to check whether the weather is freezing or not. And of course, what he's neglected to do is look at the road in front of him um, where he could see very well what the weather's like. And so as a result, he's, 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 he's slipped over and fallen over. So a bit like somebody using an iPhone instead of looking where they're going and um, falling over when they're, when they're trying to find their, their way. OK, so that's the, the, the joke, um, and that's why it's called Very Slippy Weather. But I want to look at a character just in the background behind the gentleman as he falls over. And this character is an idiot stroke imbecile character. And we know that because of the way in which he is portrayed. So there are a number of characteristics about him. And one of them is that uh, his, his facial features. So he has a low sloping forehead. Um, his eyes are half closed. He has a very small sort of pug nose, which is slightly upturned. He has a protruding upper lip. He has a, a, a hanging lower lip and uh, a very small and receding jawline, okay? As well as this, there's a number of other things about him. One is that you can see that his legs are slightly flexed. He's not standing up straight. He's very scruffy, 
his hair is very scruffy and unkempt, and some of his hair is coming through um, the hat that he's uh, that he's wearing. Um, and also the fact that he has a slightly upturned nose, this was known at the time as a celestial nose. And this indicates that not only is he an imbecile sort of character, but he's a slightly mischievous imbecile. So the upturned nose was a, was a signifier of that. Okay, so we have this imbecile character standing in the background, and I'll go into how we know that in a moment, but take a look if you can see properly at what he's holding under his arm. And uh, I don't know whether you can see it properly, but what he's holding under his arm is a pair of skates, okay? So this actually is the joke. The very clever, uh, intellectually curious gentleman who's bought himself a thermometer um, is not actually prepared for the freezing weather he's in and he's fallen over. The imbecile character is prepared for the weather and he's carrying a pair of skates. So he's properly equipped for it. So there's a sort of message here that the clever person might not be as clever as they think they are. And the uh, not so clever person might be a bit more clever than we give them credit for. Okay, so how do we know all this? Well, this all derives from what was described as, a, as a, a science, the science of physiognomy, okay? And uh, physiognomy uh, was um, the belief that people's facial features and their external features reflected the type of person and the character that they, that they were. So Gilray, the, the artist that we're looking at, actually said, um, look at the face and you will see the heart within. And it was believed that certain um, facial features signified certain um, characteristics. Um, and these beliefs have been around for quite a long time, but they became very prominent in the 18th century. And uh, Johan uh, Lavater published in the 1770s his, his essays on physiognomy. And uh, I've got an illustration from them here, which depicts 12 different facial types of idiot or imbecile people. So you can see there were these very subtle gradations about what a face would, would um, signify. And it wasn't just the face, it was actually the whole, whole body. And physiognomy also had this belief that um, uh, different parts of the face, uh, the, the, the shape of the head reflected what was happening in the, in the brain beneath. So Labater had noticed when he was at school, that um, his, his schoolmates with the best memories had very high foreheads. So he, um, you know, he believed that the forehead was where memory was located in people. So it's an interesting example of some sort of false beliefs. He didn't get it right about it, um, but actually was the precursor to a medical discovery, which was that different parts of the brain do have different functions and control different parts of the um, of, of the body. So, this physiognomy, uh, physiognomic knowledge, was very well known. Um, uh, Lavater's book went into fifty editions by eighteen ten, around the time that this caricature came out. So it was very widely read. And 18th and 19th century audiences only had to look at a, a, a picture like the one we've just seen, and they would pick up all those signs immediately. They're not obvious to us, but they were very obvious to them at the time. Um, and you can see this. Uh, this is a Scottish artist called Bayugo, uh, Bay, Bayugo who um, produced this print called 50 Easy Lessons in Caricature. Uh, in 1801, again, around the same time. And these showed how different types of faces reflected different types of person, different types of personality type, um, and so on. And I'm just gonna highlight three of the um, uh, caricatures from that group. And the first one, you, it, it, I'm, I'm sorry, it's a slightly blurry image, and I doubt if you can um, see the caption, but this is called driveling idiotism. So this was the lowest form of idiocy, if you like. And so you can see the person here 
Note the unkempt hair again, the drooping nose. Note that the eyes are pulled down, they're not wide open, the thin receding chin, and there's actually uh, a, a small amount of drool coming out of the, um, uh, of the mouth, which has a, a sort of a dangling lower lip. So um, this is a particular uh, depiction of a type of, of, of idiocy as it was understood then. Now the uh, next one, and I, I do apologize for language as I explained at the beginning, this, this was the language current at the, at, at the time. Um, and I know it can be a bit shocking, but this uh, next one on the left, we have um, stupidity. And what you'll notice here, as well as the other characteristics around the nose and the eyes, the lips and the jaw that we're already familiar with, are, is the very large area at the back of the head. So rather than having a developed front, this stupidity caricature has a very developed back. And that was uh, associated with animality. Uh, animals were considered to um, uh, have most of their brain power at the back of their head. And this was associated with force and strength rather than mental intelligence. So what this caricature is saying is that this person is, is fit for work. They could be very strong and muscular, but they lack intelligence and brain power. And then the um, final one, the caricature on the right is, is simplicity. And this is the one that is closest to the imbecile figure um, that we've just seen in Gilray's uh, very slippy weather. So note the jaw, note the upturned celestial nose denoting mischief, the uh, hanging lower lip, um, the receding jaw, and, uh, and so on. And always the hair, there's always something about the hair in these things. So these were very common understandings of what a, a so-called idiot or an imbecile would look like. Now, I've brought him back again. And what I've got to the side here is a description by Etienne Jean Georget, who, who was a medical legal theorist in Paris um, after the French Revolution in the early years of the uh, 19th century. And this was a time when uh, medics, medical men, they were all men, were taking an interest in what we would call learning disability, in idiocy and imbecility, uh, developing the large asylums in, in, in Paris um, and seeing idiots and imbeciles as they knew them as people who should be uh, under their care, who should be treated and diagnosed by them um, and who should be within an asylum rather than um, li living uh, amongst their, their communities. And look at Georges' description of what an idiot looks like. Low forehead, feeble constitution, underdeveloped for his age, he limps, his physiognomy expresses stupidity. It is known that most idiots have ill-formed heads, that they are small and suffer from rickets, and that lack of intelligence is painted on their faces. I think one of the things that's notable about this, this character in the, in the caricature is that he's a sort of indeterminate size and age, somewhere between a youth and an adult. And this is expressed in, in Georges' description. What's interesting about Georges' medical description is how much actually this isn't scientific knowledge, this is drawing on folk understandings of public understandings about what idiots and imbeciles looks like. Um, so um, Georges hasn't really discovered anything. There's no science in this description here at all. What he has done is he has appropriated this folk knowledge and he has appropriated the theories of physiognomy and he has repackaged them and said, look, I'm a medical man um, and this is what idiots and imbeciles um, look like. OK, so he's represented it as medical knowledge, although he's actually taken it from um, folk knowledge. OK, so having looked at it in quite a lot of detail, let's just come back to it and just consider the contrast between our, um, our young man at the back 
and the elderly man who has fallen over. Um, so note his very high forehead, the um, developed front of his head, his jutting much more prominent jaw, his wide open eyes, admittedly he has just fallen over, but this sort of character is always depicted with wide open uh, eyes and his um, sort of larger and more normally developed nose. So there's a contrast being made here between the clever person and the not so clever person. And therein um, lies the comedy, there, there lies the joke. So we could look at this and we could say, hmm, so is the gentleman carrying the thermometer, is he perhaps dyspraxic? Is he, is he perhaps autistic? Has he got an obsessive interest in science, in the weather, in, in, in mechanical gadgets and so on? Um, and this is all the type of speculation we can make, but you can see the difference between trying to uh, understand and construct this young character at the back and the gentleman at the front, because we do have understandings from the time of what constituted an idiot, what constituted an imbecile, these people that are loosely related to those people we call people with learning disabilities today. What we didn't have at the time then was a concept of autism. Um, and so this may well be depicting a personality type who could be described as having um, um, autism today, but that's a sort of form of knowledge that we can develop and project backwards, but it certainly wasn't in Gilray's um, mind. Uh, Gilray was talking about a particular sort of eccentric character that he and others were, were familiar with. So you can already see that there's a bit of a difference sort of developing here. Now, once we start to um, understand these depictions and read these um, uh, images in the same way that people in the 18th and 19th century did, we um, start to see it everywhere. So this is from the mid 18th century. This is William Hogarth's uh, Marriage a la Mode series, which um, um, tells a, a story. And this is the, the last plate, plate six of, of, of a series. And it's a sort of everyday story of 18th century folk. So the, the lady, uh, in, in the middle of the Countess has just committed suicide by taking um, pills um, because her lover um, has um, murdered her husband and uh, has been hanged for committing the murder. And uh, as far as she's concerned, she has nothing left to live for. Her child, who is disabled himself, um, he has uh, leg irons and some uh, black spots um, indicating hereditary syphilis is being raised by the maid to give his mother one last kiss before he dies, while her father, the merchant, uh, carefully removes the ring from her finger so that he can use it again in the future. OK, so as I said, everyday story of 18th century folk. However, let's have a look at these characters in the background. What we have here is the apothecary which is a, a chemist uh, who is the lady's apothecary. And he is berating the idiot servant because what the idiot servant did was he was sent out by the lady to fetch powders from the local apothecary shop and um, did not understand that these powders were poison and that the lady was about to commit suicide with them. So let's have a look at this in a bit more detail. So here is the apothecary berating the servant for his stupidity. Now, how do we know that this is a so-called idiot servant? Well, there are a number of indicators, and I hope you can see this clearly. If you look at the facial features, you'll recognize them. The receding jaw, the slightly hanging lips, the small nose, the slightly drooping um, eyes and um, eyelids, but there are other indicators as well. If you look at the coat, the coat is actually fine servant livery, but it's way too big for him. The uh, sleeves are coming right over his uh, hands. 
and uh, it, it hangs down um, far too far. And also, if you look closely, you'll see that it's not buttoned up correctly. He hasn't, he has um, buttoned it up in, in, in the wrong um, order. So it's uh, out of shape as well. So all these indications are here, and it was common practice for people designated as idiots or imbeciles to be employed as, as servants, not, not as fools, but as you know, generally reliable and hardworking servants. Now, again, this was understood by audiences in the day. And this is, um, there's a commentary by uh, Lichtenberg, who was a, um, a, a sort of commentator on Hogarth's work. And he comments on the fine household livery, which is too big for him, the coat being buttered up askew. And he also notices the flexed legs. We've got those slightly bent legs again. And he calls this the permanent courtesy of impotence, which they are in the act of making. So that basically, you know, this, this idiot person bends their legs as a sort of submission to the people around them. And again, look at the contrast with the apothecary who is fully upright, who has the fine um, uh, forehead, no jutting jaw, okay? There's a final thing, again, which everybody would have recognized in this portrayal. He is about to slap the servant uh, in the face with the back of his hand. Now, violence was very common in 18th century England. People were always hitting each other and fighting and doing all sorts of things. But one thing that was taboo was to hit somebody in the face. Uh, and if you did that, you were indicating to them that they were almost like um, an animal. It was not something you did to another human being. So again, probably not immediately noticeable by us, but very noticeable to an 18th century audience. Um, and um, just to show you another, there are, there are, there are masses of, um, once you start looking for this, you see it all the time, but here, here's a cartoon about, uh, by Gil Ray, about Edward Jenner, um, who developed the smallpox vaccine, which was known as the cowpox vaccine. And uh, this is being distributed, um, and, uh, people are turning into, into cows. It, it's not an anti-vax message, it's a, a satire on the anti-vaxxers of the time. And uh, note his idiot servant who has all the characteristics that we've been talking about. Uh, look at his scruffy clothes, his scruffy hair, his flexed legs, all those features, the upturned nose, the drooping lip, the receding jaw, and then contrast him with Edward Jenner, who is the uh, genius gentleman, if you like, standing very upright amongst everybody else with the, with the high forehead and, and so on. So you get this constant contrast and actually, there were two expressions from this time, which were highbrow and lowbrow, which are expressions we still use today. And highbrow um, uh, indicated genius, which was that you had a high forehead and high set uh, eyebrows. Lowbrow meant you had the, the low forehead and the beetle brow, as they, as, as they called it. So there was always this contrast between the highbrow and the lowbrow. And of course, we talk about highbrow and lowbrow um, entertainment um, today. We move on another hundred years. Um, this is Thomas Webster. Um, schoolboys arriving at school showing different attitudes. Um, now, this was done in 1862 when there was a lot of anxiety about universal education, which was introduced in 1870. And the idea that uh, idiots and imbecile children would share a classroom um, with children of, of higher or um, normal intelligence. And what you see is the boy sitting rather miserably to the to the left of the picture has these fine features, the higher brow, the jaw, and so on. But queuing to get in are a group of children with um, slumped backs, um, vacant expressions, um, uh, low jaws, and, and, and so on. So again, you get this, this high brow, low brow, um, thing. So we're, we're, we're constantly seeing and able to identify people of the scene as idiots. Now, just to show you, this is around the same time. Um, and this was um, a drawing by Edward Wimper, uh, who was a, a mountaineer, but also a man of uh, science who uh, went around sketching plants, animals and people on his travels. 
And this is a so-called cretin from the uh, Swiss Alpine uh, region. And um, uh, cretinism was associated with a form of idiocy, uh, came from a, a, a goiter in the neck, which you can um, uh, maybe see here. And that, that's um, something we can identify medically as hyperthyroidism, uh, but it was very prevalent in this area of the Alps at the time. Now, what for me is interesting about this um, portrayal of uh, a, a certain type of idiocy, um, is that of all the things we've seen so far, this is the sort of fantastical one, rather grotesque, rather gothic, uh, perhaps slightly frightening, perhaps trying to uh, titillate almost. There's almost something a little bit sort of pornographic about this to scare the audience with. Now, this is the scientific sort of medical um, uh, depiction uh, of, of idiocy, because Wimper, when he came back from his travels in the Alps in the 1880s, gave talks to the Royal Society, um, gave his drawings to the medical profession and so on. Um, and so you can see, again, how the medical profession is drawing on sort of popular fantasies, folk knowledge and so on about what um, idiocy looked like. And just to bring us up to date, this sort of imagery, this contrast between the high brow and the low brow, the, the, the genius and the, um, and, and the idiot, if you like, has never gone away. So here's uh, Dr. Julius Hibbert, the, um, the surgeon from the, the Simpsons cartoon series, and look at his high brow, very high forehead, upright uh, stature, um, wide open eyes, Contrast him with another character from The Simpsons, uh, Cretus, the slack jawed yokel. And uh, we've got all the characteristics, really, which we saw in the 18th century um, uh, depiction in Gilray's Slippy Weather. And actually, if we look at them 200 uh, years apart, but really very similar characteristics, even down to the little bit of hair poking out of the uh, top of Cletus's head and poking through the hat of, um, uh, of the young man in, in very slippy weather. So, um, okay, so there's the way in which we often talk about constructing learning disability or constructing autism. And um, it can sometimes it can sometimes sound as if we're saying there's nothing really there. It's, it's just something that we've made. But I think this is sort of quite a pragmatic way of showing that actually these things, um, um, there is something there, but we make these things through our cultural references. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at what physiognomists are saying. We're looking at what caricaturists are drawing. We're looking at what um, doctors, um, medical theorists are, are, are writing. And these things are coming together to construct um, an identity of idiocy or later men the mental defective and later the, the, the person with a, a, a learning disability. Um, OK, so. I'm saying that we can do this around um, uh, learning disability. Can we do it around autism? Can we diagnose or can we even identify autism in history. So there is a, a, a big genre, which has, uh, has been going for a few years now, of identifying characters from um, history and um, uh, applying labels of autism or Asperger's syndrome or whatever to them based on what we, what we know about them. Uh, and I'll be talking in a bit more detail about a couple of them later, but um, there are some um, problems generally around retrospective diagnosis in history. So Sigmund Freud, for example, uh, always warned that you shouldn't conduct what he called wild analysis, which was trying to psychoanalyze people who you didn't know and you haven't seen and you didn't know much about, because he for, you know, would have people sitting on his couch in his studio for um, uh, months, possibly years, before uh, reaching a conclusion um, about what their condition might be. However, he couldn't resist having a go himself, so he did actually write an essay on um, Leonardo da Vinci, um, uh, which tried to psychoanalyze Leonardo da Vinci from, from 400 years uh, earlier. 
and it was all based on a single memory that da Vinci had uh, that he'd written about in his notebooks, the only recollection of his childhood he ever wrote about how um, a vulture came to him in his cot and um, uh, opened his lips with his tail and then turned round and, and, and beat him in, in the lips. And Freud developed from this a very sort of um, intricate train of reasoning which uh, about Leonardo's psychological development, which eventually concluded that um, Leonardo was a repressed uh, homosexual. Now, the problem with this, once Freud had done it, was it was then pointed out that he was working from a faulty... Trans oh, the, the reason for this was that a vulture was an Egyptian symbol of um, motherhood. And this was all about Leonardo's relationship with his, with his mother. Um, but it was then pointed out that there'd actually been a mistranslation in the ver version that Freud was, was reading from the um, Italian. And that actually it wasn't a vulture, it was a kite. So it was just a bird. And so this was a good illustration of when we're working with very fragmented knowledge, which isn't necessarily reliable knowledge from history, um, it's very difficult for us to make um, um, hard diagnostic conclusions. Um, Eric Erickson in the 1950s did a similar thing about Martin Luther, um, but much of which was based on evidence about Luther that was written many years after he died. And sometimes it couldn't even be evidence that these things had, had even happened. And, and uh, Walter C. Langer was, was employed by the intelligence services in America to try and sort of psychoanalyze Hitler um, during World War II. And he wrote a profile of Hitler in 1943 based on his relationship with his mother and father and his repressed homosexuality and so on, um, which you know was just based on very limited sources at the, at, at the time. So there can be real problems about trying to medically diagnose in this way from a distance and on very limited um, information. So I'm just going to give a couple of um, examples from Michael uh, Fitzgerald's book, The Genesis of Artistic Creativity, which some of you might have seen, um, which uh, draws out a lot of um, uh, big important figures from, from uh, cultural, cultural history. So I've just picked um, uh, two of them. And the, the first one is Ellis Lowry, the, the artist. And, and Fitzgerald, based on what he's read about Lowry's life, says, well, he wasn't sociable. He had very narrow interests. Um, he didn't let anybody influence him. That's why he had such an idiosyncratic style. There was a lack of empathy. You can see that his figures and none of them are connected with each other. He was naive and childish, clumsy, he looked strange, he dressed poorly. He was depressed and asexual and he even became, oh, not less autistic, he became less autistic as he got older. And he concludes that section by saying, um, Ellis Lowry certainly had Asperger's syndrome. He displayed enough of the traits associated with Asperger's syndrome to meet the criteria. He then does a similar job on um, George Orwell. Um, so the great author of 1984 and Animal Farm, amongst many others. Um, and so he, he concludes that Orwell had a very narrow interest in literature and politics. He was a domineering, dogmatic and controlling person. He had a flat voice. He was tactless with women, which demonstrated lack of empathy. Like Lowry, he looked strange, he had a stiff posture, oppositionality, you know, he, he refused to go to university when he left Eton and joined the police in Burma instead. He had what Fitzgerald calls autistic aggression and perverse behaviour, say Damascism. And the uh, chapter concludes, George Orwell meets the criteria for Asperger's syndrome. Now, one of the things, hopefully, that you, you've noticed as we've gone through this is that we started to lose both L.S. Lowry and George Orwell, who become a sort of cluster of um, uh, traits and personality characteristics and pathologies. And we're starting to lose sight of a great artist and a great writer who may have had all of these characteristics, um, but that wasn't what everybody else defined them by. They were defined by their sort of great cultural productions that they, that they carried out. And there are other um, 
There's other work on retrospective diagnosis, less extreme, I think, and, and, and more measured than what Fitzgerald wrote about. Uh, so um, Owen James's Asperger's syndrome and high achievement, which looks at people like Isaac Newton, Van Gogh, Alan Turing, the Enigma um, code breaker. Uh, Uta Frith talks about the wild children that uh, let's go with John Howard, the criminal um, uh, reformer, you know, very obsessive interests in, in, in um, criminals statistics and they wrote a particular book again that some of you may know about a, a character called Hugh Blair of Borg that um, they, they, they found a court case against and they actually adopt a historical clinical approach and try to do a uh, sort of 20th century clinical analysis of him as would be done um, if he was um, with us today. Okay, so I'm gonna, I can see that I am um, getting near to my time. So I'm sorry if I take a bit of a, a gallop through things from here, but um, I'm gonna uh, just look at some of the problems that have been highlighted about this sort of uh, retrospective diagnostic approach to autism. And uh, one of them is from, uh, was one of my undergraduate students called Mariana Stasiak, who wrote a really excellent undergraduate dissertation uh, on this. and, and um, publications by Mark Osteen and, and Sonia Loftis. And what they say is what, what, what these retrospective diagnoses do is they focus on genius. They tend to focus almost always on males. Uh, 20 people in Michael Fitzgerald's book, 18 of them are men, two of them are women, and they are almost, in fact, probably exclusively um, white males. They sort of bolster stereotypes to some extent, I think, about how we conceive of um, uh, autism. They're often told as a story of compensation or overcoming so that the person's genius, those autistic, those positive autistic traits compensates for their other um, deficits and there's a singular focus on these positives to explain the person and also something that theorists like, like um, Foucault and Ian Hacking have talked about, there's an element of working backwards to create a type. So we have a type that we're looking for and we work backwards in, in history and we make sure that we identify it in the, in the people that we, that we find. And um, Sabani Dasani in a very good essay on Michael Fitzgerald's work says, it's basically a question of piecing together anecdotal evidence, dismissing anything contradictory as, as outliers, checking against a fairly rigid set of diagnostic criteria by someone who's not their psychiatrist, not their biographer. Um, so acting on scan, scant and not necessarily reliable information. Um, and so I wanna to come to um, an end by um, uh, quoting at length, this is a long quote, so I apologize, but it's by uh, a colleague of mine called Patrick McDonough, who's written a really interesting, a uh, chapter about um, uh, autism and, and modernity. And, and, and this is what he said, because I, I think this really hits the, the argument at its core. My resistance to reading historical figures or literary characters as autistic or Aspergian is based on the fundamental precept that autism, even should it turn out to be a single pathology with an organic cause and thus real, it is a thing, uh, if it has an organic cause, but it's also perceived within a social dynamic. And our recognition and understanding of this dynamic takes place within this dynamic. If the social circumstances allowing us to perceive autism did not exist before some point relatively early in the 20th century, and if the perception and articulation of autism, how we see it and how we talk about it is part of its being, then to what extent can we say the condition existed previously? Certainly the organic foundation of autism is likely continuous. There were people in the past who we would diagnose as autistic today, but without the social dynamic, can this organic component alone actually represent autism as we understand the term? So he's saying, sure, maybe Isaac Newton had an organic condition which we would identify as autism today, but that was very far from the way he was understood. He understood himself. Um, in his own time. Okay. And so that I think really 
concludes the argument I've given. As I've said, there are others who will argue differently to me, and I'm always happy to debate that argument um, with people and, 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 and listen to alternative views. But I wanted to um, give you this sort of um, side of the, the sort of more skeptical view of um, identifying people as, as um, uh, having autism in, in history. Okay. Um, and so um, to finish off, I think what I'm not I think what I'm arguing is we can identify understandings of learning disability or its precursor idiocy in other times by bringing together these social, cultural and medical sources that Patrick um, was talking about in his quote. To diagnose idiocy in the past medically ourselves uh, we can we can understand how people in the past diagnosed how medical profession in their social context diagnosed idiocy to retrospectively diagnose learning disability ourselves using modern diagnostic processes is i think speculative almost to the point of meaningless because it lacks that social and cultural context on autism i'd say the identification of people with a type of mind that might be considered autistic today is possible in a speculative way. But I think the interest of that is not because the person was autistic, because they weren't in their time, but to understand how such a mind was perceived and understood in its time, and actually how we might understand such times non-pathologically and non-diagnostically today. But I would argue that retrospective diagnosis of autism is, is deeply speculative, and um, because it lacks that sort of cultural and social context, um, um, it's really us projecting our current pathology and mania for diagnosis onto the past. So perhaps tells us something about ourselves. And there I'll end with this story of highbrows and lowbrows. So thank you very much for listening. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Simon. That was really interesting um, to listen to. I know I was taking a lot in when we have our staff chat and we're like oh that's so cool that's really interesting um we're really deep in our staff chat so moving on to other que people's questions so I stopped talking myself um the first question we have from one of the audience members it's quite an interesting one um and it's saying I'll just read the question out and try to ad lib so as you say autism as a diagnostic name is an occurrence to use with regard to any century previous to the 20th. But that's not just autism. Homosexuality, for example, didn't become a term to the 19th century. But obviously, queerness has existed throughout history and potentially so has neurodivergence. So what is your review on the differences between queer reading of history and, say, disability or neurodiverse readings of historical texts? Yeah, that is a, um, a, a really interesting question. And I think there are si similar debates in, in that field. And I, I, I think it boils down in the end to us recognizing the similarities, but also recognizing the enormous differences that there were in the social and cultural contexts of different periods. And we do have a tendency to um, project our current preoccupations and beliefs into our reading of history. Um, now, there is some very um, high quality, very good um, queer readings of history, feminist readings of history, um, racial ethnicity readings of history, and, 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 and so on. Um, and also uh, class readings, um, think of, of E.P. Thompson and, and, and so on. And I think the best history in those fields are those that go from the starting point of understanding uh, that um, the past is another country, you know. OK, so uh, what uh, people believed, uh, what people believed about themselves, what they believed about others, they thought in a radically different ways uh, to us. Uh, and I think if you get that, then you get some really interesting insights and you also get some information about how we might change ourselves and how we might think differently today and that we, we don't have a monopoly of universal everlasting truths. The worst history in all those fields, I think, 
are those which um, sort of basically take our set of beliefs and preoccupations and uh, straitjacket the past uh, in them. Great, thank you. Um, so another question, and I, yeah, this is something I was interested in too. And so you obviously talked about this, this is what I know I'm gonna say, physiology. Physi physiognomy. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Um, and so the questions about kind of your opinions, obviously it was kind of a pseudoscience back then, it was being dismissed in the original research, but there's been current research kind of in the last okay, five, 10 years, maybe less than that, but has looked at like kind of bringing it back, especially around autistic people and kind of there's a research that suggests that autistic people have larger heads, for example. Um, do you have any thoughts about that, especially in kind of relation to historical depictions like you showed um, in the past? Yes, um, and I mean, um, I, I think one of the things we can say about physiognomy is that they were sort of lavater and everybody was on to something, yeah? And so, um, and actually it was from physiognomy that our understanding of the cerebral hemispheres um, came and of the um, different functionality of, of, of different parts of the brain and, um, and so on. Um, so, um, yeah, and we hear, you know, a lot of people talk about, um, you know, I've heard a lot of talk about uh, people who have autism having um, very uh, sort of uh, regular and well-formed faces and, and, and this and that. What, happened was that um, th there was a, a big diversion off into skull measurement and looking at skull shape and skull size and everything. And actually, um, once people had stopped fiddling their results when they were trying to compare the skull sizes of um, uh, geniuses uh, with uh, the skull sizes of idiots, um, they finally had to um, uh, acknowledge that uh, actually, you know, skull size has nothing and, and, and brain size have very little to do with with what we call um intelligence you know uh, it, it's it's much more to do with with functionality and um you you have um uh, down uh, uh, Langdon down uh, at the idiot asylum in in Oswood saying um look I've, I've measured all these skulls and I have to say there are people with small heads who are very clever and there are people with big heads who are not clever at all so um, you know, I, I don't think we can um, uh, call this um, a, an exact science, but I, 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 I don't think we can also totally dismiss the link between um, a, a appearance and various types of person. I mean, we just have to look at the different characteristics of different people around the world. You know, people's appearances change in their in, in environments. So, um, and I've always had some respect for physiognomy, actually, because it's it led somewhere. It was a scientific endeavor that, that, that led somewhere, although a lot of it was just plain wrong. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, so another question, I'm just gonna read this out loud because I haven't had a chance to re-summarize it. So do you think it could be argued that a lot of the issues with retrospective diagnosis exist in current medical diagnosis of autism, ADHD and mental illness? So I guess the idea of kind of seeing the diagnosis as kind of very small boxes, you know, autism is this, mental illness is this. Um, and so the idea of not being able to kind of describe your diagnosis within these rigid diagnostic criteria, you actually find yourself excluded from diagnosis. Do you think that plays a role in this? Yes, I, I mean, I think that there is, I think there has never been a society like as for its um, need for diagnosis, its need for classification. The 19th century was very much like it, as was the 20th century. But I, I, I think we sort of exceed all other societies in doing this. And it becomes very important for us to wrap a cluster of characteristics about any person we encounter who does who appears 
to us to deviate from some sort of norm and box them and classify them. And of course, it's a futile endeavor because what it totally misses is the individuality of people. So there are people who do not fit that cluster of characteristics who may have an autistic type personality or an Asperger's syndrome type personality um, and who find themselves struggling for a diagnosis because they don't happen to fit that, that cluster. Um, but we, we do try to justify this by going back retrospectively and saying, look, this person was like that, that person was like that. Well, yeah, maybe they, maybe they were, but why are we having to go and diagnose them? And when I was talking about uh, Orwell and L.S. Lowry and those characterizations, what really saddened me when I was just putting that up on, on the PowerPoint was how suddenly you start to see these two fantastic minds as a cluster of pathologies, you know, um, and uh, that's what I think we miss and what I think uh, previous eras, including the 18th century, uh, can teach us a lot about, about simply being interested in and um, um, respectful of types of mind which are very different to our own. No one ever pathologized Isaac Newton. Um, so he didn't end up in an assessment and treatment unit. And um, otherwise, we might still be trying to understand the laws of physics. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, running close to time, I'm going to take one more question. Um, so kind of how does this understanding, this approach to a historical diagnosis, retrospective diagnosis, fit in um, with wider disability studies and actually influence attitudes today towards difference? Um, is it kind of prevalent in academic and medical spheres? Um, yeah, what do we need to be aware of to be different from our history, so not kind of, I guess, repeat ourselves yeah. by learning from it? Yeah, really good question and a really big question as well. And I think our starting point for that has to be this concept of disability, which incorporates so many things, uh, sensory, uh, impairments, deafness, blindness, physical impairments, mental health, learning disability, and so on and so on. It is only us since really the mid 20th century, I would say, who have put all of those conditions under an overriding um, uh, category of disability. Okay, so we've already done something very different to what the um, what the past did. So there was not a concept in the 18th century of a, uh, a blind person having the same set of concerns and preoccupations and problems as a physically impaired person, as a so-called idiot, as a so-called lunatic. Um, and again, I think, uh, so it's the same two lessons. I think we do not project back uh, pathologies and categories if we really want to understand what was happening at the time. But I think we can allow earlier times to project forward to us and give us an understanding of what we've done and how we operate and how we encase different types of disability in certain types of, of, of language. So I think this approach is absolutely uh, critical in disability history and in disability theory to sort of gain this understanding of how things we call disability were categorized and understood uh, both a self-image and other people's image extremely differently in the past. I hope that answer, that doesn't begin to answer that question. It was such a good big question. It could be another lecture, but uh, yeah. No, I think that's great. And I think that's a perfect way to end this talk. You couldn't be better if we tried to end on that note. Um, so thank you everyone so much for attending this evening. I hope you learned something. I know I did. And thank you so much for Simon for sharing your research and your time with us. Um, obviously this is recorded. Yeah. So we'll share the recording with you afterwards for those who, like me, want to take notes and didn't have a chance today. Um, thank you and hopefully we'll see some of you tomorrow. Bye. <laughs>